open up of the workshop session of the city uh, city of Asbury Park uh, oh, yeah. Council meeting. Council Member Clayton here. Council Member Kendall here. Deputy Mayor Quinn here. Mayor Moore here. Can we please rise for a silent prayer, a moment of reflection, please. Chapter 231, Public Law 1975, adequate notice of this meeting has been provided in the following manner. The annual notice was forwarded to the Asbury Park Press and posted on Star Ledger on January 6, 2016, and posted on a bulletin board the same date. All notices are on file with the city clerk. We're now up for items for review by city manager for prior council meetings. None at this time, Madam Clerk. Special events, Leisha? Council. First application before you tonight is the annual farmers market, which should begin on May 14th and run through October 31st. It will be held at the corner of 5th and Sunset Avenues, as in previous years. Next is a request from the Charity Kings to uh, reserve a date for 2017 for the Jazz Festival. Originally, they wanted to schedule it for this July but they requested to postpone it for 2017, so they're requesting that the date be held for them, Sunset Park. The next application, Willie's Cafe Launch Party, is canceled. Next is the uh, Little League and Middle School Baseball Parade. Little League is requesting to do a parade on June 11th between the hours of 10 a.m. and 12 p.m. VNA is seeking to do their annual community day on June 11th. It would be held at their location and in Fireman's Park as well. Next, the Tigger House Bicycle Event Fundraiser. They are seeking to um, simply ride through our city as a part of their bike fundraiser on June 17th between the hours of 9 a.m. and 12 noon. Um, Mary's Place by the Sea would like to do a walk um, beginning at beginning in Ocean Grove, going to Convention Hall and back on May the 21st from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. There is one application that I neglected to include, and that's for Jersey Pride, which will be held on um, June the 5th. Packet. I'm sorry? Jersey Pride was in my packet. Oh, okay. I guess I just forgot on the resolution then. So that would be the next application for approval, um, the annual event, 25th year. And lastly, we have three weddings, one on June 10th on 8th Avenue Beach, the next one on September 4th on 6th Avenue Beach, and the last one on September 10th on 2nd Avenue Beach. Any questions? Yes, I have one. I yes. see that, um, what do you call it, a charity group? Charity Kings? Mm -hmm. Charity Kings, okay. They're going to have a jazz festival? Yes. Now, we haven't had a jazz festival in, what, the last four or five years? And the city used to put it on? And the city used to put it on? And one of the questions I have is this. Why is it that the city can't come up with a jazz and gospel festival yet? Um, that's actually something I can't answer. I, I know in the past, um, Tom this Gilmore... Is something that's been uh, people in the community have been asking me day to day. I understand. I get calls as well, too. Yes. Yeah. I, I know in the past, Tom Gilmore did attempt to pull together a jazz festival. There were some logistical issues, but I, I really can't answer that question. My recollection, Jesse, and this is before you were on, and John, correct me if I'm wrong, we RFP'd it multiple times and got next to zero responses. We rfp for somebody to do... A, a jazz festival. Not that that answers your question exactly, but that's my recollection of it prior to prior to all of us getting on in the, in the 2014 election. You're correct. 
Uh, Leisha, mm -hmm. the farmer's market? Yes. They don't have to pay fees? No, that's actually co-sponsored by the city. Okay. Any other questions? I'd just like to say there's gospel groups that I can get in touch with, and there's also different bands that will do this free if we consider it. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah, and, and part of the problem also is the MOU as far as what the city can and can't spend as far as like we're sitting on transitional aid. Uh, as much as the city, you know, the state said get rid of the horses, as much as the state said get rid of this, you're, you're sitting on transitional aid. We, we're we're going to limit you to what you can spend out of your own tax dollars. So that was also another piece of the puzzle. That's something we can still look into and see if we can figure it out. Maybe we can get some but he won the $400 million in Mercer County to put it on. But, uh, that, that was also part of the problem. So All right, thank MOU you. MOU and transitional aid. And just before Alicia goes, uh, and Alicia, as everybody knows, was very instrumental in the rodeo for recreation. And uh, since the last week part, we, uh, we continue to receive, receive donations. Uh, Atlantic Architectural Millwork, Jay Harmon, Central Jersey Club, the National Association of Negro Business and Professional Women's Club, Megan Ann Carroll, Better Home Realty, and First e Energy have all made very generous donations in the last week or so. Uh, so anybody out there, please keep on writing those checks, send those checks to One Municipal Plaza, City of Asbury Park, Detention Alicia, make the checks out to the Asbury Park Recreation Trust Fund, and we can just keep on getting that number. I know we're over 40, so we can keep on going. Mm -hmm. wow. So again, thank you, Alicia. Thank you. Next, our items to be presented. The first one is Michelle Alonzo, Director of Planning and Redevelopment for proposed changes to the Central Business District Redevelopment Plan Sound Mitigation. Good evening, Council, members of the public. As is as is no surprise to anyone, we have in the Central Business District Redevelopment Plan separate standards for, for sound than the rest of the general city ordinance. As part of the, the process, a business has to supply the city with a sound report recording decibel levels of music that they wish to play or at the same level of, of performance and provide a report to the zoning officer. Um, what ha the way this section of the redevelopment plan was written, it was an amendment in 2011, was very broad. It pertained to any form of music played electronically so that, of course, meant anything from a radio to a live band. If it came through a speaker, you were supposed to submit a sound report. Um, we are proposing to amend the redevelopment plan that no longer requires that a pre-report must be submitted. However, what we are keeping in the redevelopment plan are the sound standards that have been in there since 2011 that businesses have to just comply with on a day-to-day -day basis. They're considered reasonable and they fall within the guidelines of DEP. What I have added in order to try to, to achieve what the, the amendment for sound mitigation report, sound report, was trying to do is I'm proposing to add language that if you are certain use, that and whether you're certain use or if you abut residential yeah, or you have residential above, you have to provide sound insulation materials upon construction. If you have an application type of use that has to go to the planning board, you would put it in with your planning board documents. If you have a use that doesn't need to go to the planning board, but you are an eating and drinking establishment, a fitness center, a performance space, live music venues, venues where music is provided by a DJ, then, and you do not need to go to the planning board, 
and you have to provide on your construction plan sound insulating material if you're doing a rehabilitation of more than 50 percent. That currently exists is what you're saying. That No, that is what I'm adding in lieu right. of the sound report because what the sound report was partially doing is when the engineer went out there, he would say, you want to be able to increase the level of music you can play here? Insulate the ceiling, insulate the walls. So instead, we're going to put that in the redevelopment plan as a requirement for commercial uses that have the potential to be a little louder than some others, like if you have live music and if you're an eating and drinking establishment. So let me, unless I don't, does anyone else? Okay, so I just have a couple of questions. Yes. Um, and I skimmed the articles that came out about it, um, um, except for, you know, I read the city's article. So if you are a restaurant establishment that plays some background music while people have dinner, that requires what? So if you're, a so with this amendment I'm proposing, if you're an existing restaurant and you play background music, you do not have to provide a report, nor do you have to provide sound insulation. So the grandfather. Correct. Thank you. Okay, and the sound mitigation report was implemented by, it's obviously not this council, right, because we, we barely knew about it until everything hit the fan. So what year was the sound mitigation report implemented? It was added to the redevelopment plan what in year? 2011. Okay. But the, what this amendment does, it, it eliminates the require for anyone to do a report. What it does, if you're doing a substantial rehabilitation, in other words, if you're going down to the studs anyway, and you are a certain type of business that could crank, crank have a lot of noise or crank up music, then you would need to put insulation in your walls and your ceiling. And I think it, it tries to, it try, not mm -hmm. everything that the sound mitigation report system was trying to achieve, but it obviously did not achieve what we were looking for. Because the sound mitigation report does not prevent someone from violating their own report. So you can do the sound mitigation report and be in compliance. It doesn't stop someone that night managing the facility from turning the music up. It doesn't stop someone from having a live performance that's decibels higher than your sound mitigation report ever envisioned. It was partially an education step, and it was partially a way to have documentation to be able to, um, if there was an establishment that was in violation, to be like, you're in violation of your own report. Right, it wasn't to affect Toast, who, who does some sound music over brunch. Right. right, but the pr issue with the way this ordinance is written now, it is written so broadly that it set base says anything that com basically is emitted by a speaker. Okay. Which, what wouldn't be emitted by a speaker? Someone singing. <laughs> <laughs> but still then, if you're obviously... With no microphone, right? right. So if you just exactly. stand in a restaurant That's and right. sing. <laughs> Does anyone else have any more questions? And oh, let me add that this is a referral to the planning board because this isn't located in a redevelopment plan. That the planning board has to it has to have a hearing by the planning board, and then it would come back to council as an ordinance with two readings. Yeah, I have a question. So we discovered a mistake. We're correcting the mistake, and we want to correct it as soon as possible. How do we ask the planning board, they have a meeting next week, to put this on their agenda? The city manager has already put a call in to the chairman. And what did he say? I emailed him. Uh, I emailed him around 5 o'clock stating that um, if your agenda hasn't been done, can you please put this on and that we'll get the final language to everyone first thing in tomorrow morning. So we're just waiting to hear back from him. And I, I would think they would want this cured, fixed as soon as possible also. I mean, I, one of the, you know, we got hammered, maybe rightfully so. I mean, I saw a foot lose, it cracked me up. I mean, you know, 
the city without dancing. I didn't want to see. I, I didn't want to see like on the uh, Rolling Stones, Asbury Park kills all music. So I mean, as soon as we found out about this mistake, we jumped on it immediately. Uh, we're in the process of correcting it. Tonight's the first step. Wednesday we'll adopt it, and then we're asking the planning board please put it on your next week agenda. And, and hopefully the planning board will. And why wouldn't they? Well, I guess we'll find out if they do or don't. Okay. Does anyone have any more questions? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. The next item for presentation is by uh, William Stuckey from Dollar Tree at uh, 1005 Main Street. Uh, good evening. Um, I am here, uh, back in April, I uh, submitted a letter to the mayor and council regarding um, the possibility of applying for a tax abatement for the Dollar Tree store that we're contemplating building at the corner of uh, 3rd and Main. And I don't know if you all remember the letter or not, but I'm just going to digress for a moment. A couple years ago in 2014, Oh, I work for Fasano Properties, I should state that. Um, in 2014, before I was working with Pat, he got an approval to build a store on the corner of 4th and Main. And he couldn't work out the parking or loading at that particular time. And then last spring, we received planning board approval for a store in the same location at 4th and Main where the Getty gas station is. and. Um, we had issues with loading, and we bought, uh, or we contracted to buy the mattress store at the corner of 3rd and the Tex-Mex bakery, and we were going to put parking at that location and dedicated to Dollar Tree and direct them to the store on the corner of 4th and Main. Uh, several problems occurred as we got further into the development process. We had poor soils at the Getty gas station, and the structure was going to be a steel structure, which is expensive to build. And we were going to have to cut into the back of the building um, for uh, Dollar Tree's deliveries. So several things, a couple of things happened, just to sum it up briefly. The cost ex escalated exponentially with an expensive foundation and the steel structure, and the size of the building was decreased. Um, in January of this year, Pat and I uh, were out at the Getty gas station and walking back to our office, which is about a block and a half away. And we looked at the mattress store and we said, well, maybe we could do the Dollar Tree here by adding an addition to the right of the mattress store as you're facing it to Main Street. And I said, well, we need to provide parking. And um, so we had our engineer lay out par uh, lay out the addition to the uh, store on the right-hand side and provide parking on those three lots. And um, we don't have access presently to that parking lot as the siding depot owns that lot. But they want to use the, um, the back of their storage area. We own property back there and they have agreed to give us um, to write an access agreement for the parking for the Dollar Tree store in exchange for us giving them the land um, behind their current storage facility, uh, which is part of the Getty gas station. It's sort of like a flag lot that goes out to, towards the railroad tracks. So um, we haven't signed a lease with Dollar Tree. We're negotiating. We haven't put in an application to the planning board. We're trying to work through the lease and, and ascertain our costs better now before we go and spend all the money with engineers and architects um, and lawyers and traffic planners and so on. So, so um, I talked with Eric Aguiar and I, I said, you know, we, th the taxes are somewhat high in Asbury Park for commercial space mm -hmm. and um, Dollar Tree has a figure that they typically pay and, um, and Pat and I talked about it and said, you know, if we, if we come in for an abatement, 
we would want to do it so it's revenue neutral to the city over the five year of the abatement term, which I outlined in this letter, which I, I think you all have seen. And more importantly, I want to get to the jobs aspect of this. You know, the, the abatement is revenue neutral, and if the site stays the way it is, it's $350,000 in taxes to the city over the next 22 years. And if the abatement's granted, it's almost 600000 So th that's good. And I think it cleans up that corner of Main and 3rd Avenue. Um, I don't have a rendering to show you, but we're, co we're contemplating, and I think we're, if we get to the planning board, we're not going to do a building with the arch. We're going to have do a building that is, has a parapet wall and is straight across the front. We think it's more attractive. So when I, I, interestingly enough, when I brought in this letter to give to Michael to distribute to you all, I, I saw a bond. And we started talking. And I said, you know, they're going to be bringing 30 jobs to this area. And she told me, she said, well, it's really important um, that we do everything we can to ensure that the staffing for the Dollar Tree store is done with local people. And I agreed with her. And, um, and I met with Yvonne on the 26th of April. And uh, we talked for about 45 minutes. And I took notes, copious notes. And I came up with an action plan, which I'm going to leave with you all tonight. I wanted to talk about it first before actually giving you a letter that we're committing to do to hire local people. So. I also talked to a senior operations manor at Do a manager, a vice president at Dollar Tree, to talk to him about how they go about hiring people, and this is how they do it. They, uh, for the management, for the store manager and assistant manager positions, they allow applicants to apply online on their website, and they advertise these positions. There would probably be four in this particular store. Um, on their website. For hourly employees, um, they do not advertise on the website, but they have, you can go to their website, which, which I'll get into in a moment, and download their application and apply. But what, that doesn't benefit this community or people that live here unless they know about the jobs. So in talking to Yvonne, we came up with five different um, I'll call them organizations or institutions that, that I would personally sit down with and talk to about when Dollar Tree is going to start hiring, give them applications that they can copy and make you know the members of the Boys and Girls Club or the high school for seniors or people that are graduating and want jobs. The, well, let, let me back up a second. So the, the five... Uh, organizations that I would go to or institutions. The high school, talk to Brian Stokes. I would talk to the director of the Boys and Girls Club. I would sit down with interfaith neighbors. I'd talk to Reverend Johnson at the Community Action Network. And I would talk with Chelsea Kay at the Community uh, Development Initiatives. Um, so in, in talking to them, what does that actually mean? Something's got to you know, result from this. Well, I'm in charge of building this project, negotiating the lease, building this project, and working with Dollar Tree. Once the shell is done, they bring in their construction people to finish out the inside. They start, they um, put a banner on our construction fence that says Dollar Tree now hiring at about 90 days before they're going to open the store. And they put, um, um, advertisements in other stores in the area. Um, but again, I want to narrow it down. And what's important is to narrow it down to Asbury Park, not Neptune or Ocean. So, so when I meet with these institutions and the people, I want to talk with them about how they communicate with the people that are involved in those organizations. I would hope that they could if they don't have email addresses for all of the people, perhaps 
there is um, a way for them to get them so that they can send out a block, a mass email about 90 days before the, st the store is going to open it and about 30 days before they're going to accept applications. So they would send out this email and they would say the, that, that there are 25 positions open and you can get an application here at the Boys and Girls Club and you can give, give it to this particular person there. And uh, once the, they've hired the store manager who will interview the hourly workers at this store, I can pick up the applications and take them to the manager. They, um, and, I, and I think that I can obviously be somewhat persuasive and say, look, because I'm going to be working closely with their construction people and management and say, you know, I'd really appreciate it if you give the people in Asbury Park the first, you know, a, a real close look as you're going through the hiring process. So the, the, the best that I can commit to is meeting with these organizations, bringing them applications, tell, making them aware of where the website is. They can, if they can get their peop, the people in these organizations or clubs to fill out applications, I can, I can, I can just pick them up meet with the store manager and give people that live locally in this town the opportunity to go to work. So I um, outline that um, and I've signed the letter and I'm committed to doing it. It is some work. I'm happy to do it. I would meet with the organization sometime in the summer or early fall. If we go forward with this project, um, I think that we'll unfortunately be starting construction in December. Um, unfortunately, I don't anticipate Dollar Tree opening until next November. They have a blackout period in, during which time they will not open new stores from August 1st until October 31st every year. And I don't think that we're going to make, if we build it, we're going to get it done by uh, next July 31st. So. Um, asking you to do something concrete. Well, first of all, do you have questions for me and comments? Can I see a copy of that letter? Yes. I have one for each of you. I appreciate you coming back with um, a plan. Well, you can thank Yvonne. She helps a great deal. This, what we, what we got, Mr. What is it, Bucky? Bill Stuckey. Stuckey. Um, okay, so this replaces what's in this, which was just a now hiring sign, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we drilled down a lot deeper than that. Okay. I don't have any questions. Anybody have a question? So uh, what, uh, what, you know, I know this isn't, uh, um, and maybe I'm out of line in asking this, but I wanted to know before we bring this formally before the council and spend three or four thousand dollars on having an attorney draft an ordinance uh, to put before you to vote on, I just wanted to know if, if, you know, individually if you would support this given what I've told you and put before you tonight in writing. Um, it looks good to me. Uh, just so people in the audience understand, when you were saying cost neutral, do you want to explain it or I yes. can explain? <laughs> Essentially, you the do city it. gets. You do it. So, just so when everybody um, pilots abatement, things like that, right, the, they're broken up into bits and pieces. The county gets a piece, the city gets a piece, so on and so forth. The city receives. Um, 58%. Well, <laughs> right. So, in this circumstance, the city is currently getting. 
I'm going to say is getting about 11,000 a year. 11,000 a year in taxes and with with the municipal portion being 11,000. Yes, taxes, the right? municipal portion. Okay. Yes. And so the city obviously is going to get a lot more in taxes once this is built over 100,000 and we the city would receive 100% of what they would get under the conventional taxes. Yes. That, am I explaining that yeah. right, Michael? Yeah. So the city's at no loss monetarily, and then conceivably you're going to hire locally by working with these organizations. So any cost savings to you, you'll get, but you will also do your due diligence in hiring locally. And I've thought about it a great deal. It's something I can do. It's not a full-time job. And um, I, quite frankly, I think that there will be a number of qualified people that will hear about this and apply for the jobs and you know as I said at the end of my letter I will come back to you once the store opens I will meet the manager find out who was hired from Asbury Park and come back and report to you how many people were are employed at that store when it opens great I have no problem no okay if Sounds I can just good. indicate that a, a conceptual uh, not of approval from the council tonight to move it on to the next steps doesn't bind the council to do anything when it comes back before them for formal approval. So just know that. Yes. I the only, the only thing I would add is you have the five you're going to reach out to. Yes. Make it six. Make sure our communications directors. Okay. Number six. Okay. Let me make a note of that. Yep. Because mm -hmm. we can help also. And she's here. I mean, she can give you a card. And again, thank you. Okay, I'll make sure that happens. Yep, no problem. All right, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to the next item review of agenda items for Wednesday's meeting. Who's got questions? I have some questions. Go ahead. Okay, well, honestly, I'm going to just tell you, Michael, and you tell me if I, if I understand it correctly. And somebody can go before me, Lord knows, and then that way if you if you hit mine, I don't have to go. Well, I'll go 2016-226, resolution amending temporary appropriations for 2016. That's one of mine. Okay, yeah. so this, I know what it's doing, is, and you can explain what it's doing, and then my question is, does this impact the projected tax increase? No, there's no impact on the tax increase. Um, what happens until you adopt the budget, there's a thing called the temporary budget, which is 26.25% of the previous year's budget. So for the first quarter, we budget 26.25%. This amends, it, in the second language, emergency temporary appropriations. This just amends the temporary budget to put more money into it, which is included as part of the regular budget. That's all it does. Okay. Um, 227, it, it didn't have the attachment. I know you sent it out, and I asked for a hard copy. I don't have it, so no big deal. That's Give my hard point. copy. I'll read it. Uh, and, and for 227, 90% of that's going to be reimbursed by FEMA? In yes, the, the resolution in question is for the wastewater treatment plant roof repair, which was damaged by Sandy. Um, there was additional work that had to be done as we found more issues with the roof. Um, through TNM, this is a change of approximately twenty-five and a half thousand dollars, ninety percent of which is reimbursable to FEMA. The cost of the city is twenty-five hundred dollars. That's all the questions I have. Okay, the second reading two sixteen seventeen. Uh, that's just uh, that starts the process of us repairing the roads. It puts more money into the road project. Yes. And then eighteen is looking to save some money by. Refunding the bond payments. Correct. So we're hoping to save approximately forty thousand um, dollars. Under this, it allows us to look. If we save, we save. If we don't, we don't have to do anything. And we're tabling two sixteen, eleven, and fifteen. Simply, just so you know. Well, we still have to make the motions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. On Wednesday. I'm going. Yeah. yeah I'm just. I'm going. Mm -hmm. I'm going through my to-do mm -hmm. list. Mm -hmm. Was that two thousand? Which one is where we have? Eleven and fifteen. Oh, eleven and fifteen. <coughs> and would you just explain twenty sixteen? Ordinance number 2016-16. It's the 
Uh, that's trucks, equipment for public works, equipment for the city, just general capital equipment. This is a, we're looking for the bigger truck to help plow, front end loader, um, security within the building, um, tissues for Amy, um, other capital expenses. Any other questions on the agenda? Just one more. On resolution 2016-230, authorizing the encroachment into the right of way? Yes. All right, and this is, the city planner was okay with this and it's not an issue? The question is on resolution 2016-230. Yes. The retaining wall? There's it's the a, retaining wall. It's a retaining wall. It's a retaining wall. Yeah. It, there's pictures in it. There, there's already a retaining wall that's been constructed on, on part of the property on one side, and they want to finish it off and do the same retaining wall on the other on the side. Neighbor. Oh, well, they said it was two different addresses. The well, neighbor wants to do it. It's, the, 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 it's the, on the neighboring property, but then it continues on to the subject okay. property. All so right. the same wall goes from the neighbor's property onto this property, but only to a certain degree. And the property owner would like to continue it to the end of its property. Okay. Thank you. Which I have no problem with that, but. And I would think it's going to be a lengthy legal yeah. process, but if it is, then they should pay seven escrow. They, they have. They have. They have? Okay. Yeah. Yes. We wouldn't even, we told them we're not going to even put it here until you pay okay. money. We changed this. Originally, what was being considered was an easement, which is of a permanent nature, and we decided to go the route of a license, which is revocable at the will of the city. So this is similar to what you did with Tallulah's and happiness with the vestibules so that you can review this, and if there's problems, you can require the property owner to remove it at some point in the future. It's not going to be constructed with mortar. It's just it's pavers that will be placed in there, um, and this is it gives you more control. Yeah. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Matters by city council. Any matters by city council. Yvonne? Oh, I don't have anything. Jesse? Yes. <clears throat> Jack, Jackie Pappas and the Chamber of Commerce uh, made a request that the council wear pink Wednesday, mm -hmm. and also she would like for the residents of Lansbury Park to start wearing more pink, and it would be good for us to support her. Um, it's about... Um, Rem reminding hey. women to get mammograms. 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 Thank you. Perfect. Also, uh, we lost another uh, representative of Asbury Park this past week. His name was Butch Saunders. Uh, most of the people around him know him as uh, Mr. Boys Club. Uh, he also was a former mayor. Uh, I believe it was the 80s or 90s, the late 90s. So, so we just sent out our sympathies to his family. That's it. Thank you. I got nothing. Uh, what? Oh, yeah. Just l last week, there was a uh, interfaith opened up and dedicated two new homes, 13 17 DeWitt Avenue. Again, a wonderful event. Thank you, interfaith. Uh, I was hoping on this agenda we would have something as far as like. We're probably the only town in Monmouth County, I could be wrong, where if like burglar alarms go off, they just keep on going off, going off, going off, going off, going off, going off. We do not charge them to get them fixed, so hopefully that'll be on the next agenda. And then I, I've got a comment. I know the policymakers have sent out, I was going to say, uh, edict, whatever, like, let's get downtown under control. and. From everything I've been reading and heard this weekend, we, we lost downtown again. So. And the irritating thing about that, Michael, is that we send emails, either or John Moore, myself, Yvonne, saying forget overtime, get cops out in the downtown. Like I, I don't know how many more emails or phone calls we can make to say get cops in the downtown. And I don't want to hear, well, we thought it was going to rain, so nobody's going to be there. Asbury Park is going to be bombed one way, more than one way, if it rains or if it's the sun's out. And I mean, so I mean, 
we have set the tone and we're the policy makers spend the money do it do it get the downtown under control because i honestly i'm getting sick and tired of all the phone calls on the weekend and when i get them i call you and then you call the deputy police chief we we all get we're, we're frustrated and it, again it's not like we're saying oh don't spend the money I mean, we've gone as far as if you need the county sheriff's office, if you need the U.S. Marshals, if you need whatever you need. But, I mean, and it's not every establishment. Some establishments have great plans, and they're doing their job, but it's one or two maybe, and I don't even know, I'm not going to say who they are, but our police department should know who they are, and I think our residents know who they are. And, again, what does it take for us to, like, do you want us to pass a resolution, spend whatever it takes to get it under control? Uh, Salerno and I have, have weekly discussions on this now, and this weekend was the worst that we've seen in the last six weeks. Um, we do know who the, the businesses are, and Salerno and I will be talking in the next day or two to make sure that there's adequate staff near and around those businesses. Okay. And we'll have to review the, the plans. And again, it, um, I implore everyone to call so that there is documented history of it when it comes up for the license renewal that we can require the plans. That is going to be huge moving forward, yeah. but we have been staffing. This weekend was out of control. And when they're so, and and I, I I go out to dinner every Saturday night, and every Saturday night I walk down Cookman Ave. Somebody pulls me in their store to complain about Saturday nights on Cookman Ave. I'm out early. I'm, I'm a lot earlier than the people <laughs> running the problems because I got a baby. Um, so, for example, and I'm sure we're going to have some people at the mic talk about it, when you're opening your store up and it's full of vomit and garbage at your front, you have a window like Dino's broken because of a fight, you're calling the next day and making a police report on garbage and vomit from your store? You want Everything. You want an officer We that? want everything because that's how we can track where things are happening and going. It doesn't hurt to make the phone call. No one should be annoyed that, we're make, that the phone call is coming in that we need to be able to document as much as possible. And for those we, those areas, we have an idea where they're coming from, a very strong idea, and we'll be addressing it. And if we don't start doing something about, and I think this is yeah. what Michelle's looking at with the Central Business District, if we don't start opening up the usage on the first floor, it's just going to continue to be bars and restaurants, right? Because they're the only ones that can pay the rent. So if we don't start looking at the Central Business District plan, which to John Moore's credit has, has mentioned it since he and I have been on the council, if we don't actually start to do that, nobody can buy the space on Cookman Ave unless you're a bar or restaurant and pay the amount of space, square footage. Mm -hmm. what, what, you, every, you know what I'm saying, I'm not feeling well, but uh, so I'm not articulating this well, but nobody else can afford to buy a space on Cookman Ave other than a bar and restaurant conceivably right and, yeah. and charge those kind of prices so unless we start looking at changing that usage a little bit and being which i know previous councils have not been open to if we don't start op you know being a little bit more open-minded about what we allow on the first floor of cookman ave um, it's going to be a lot more of the same well as part of background for everyone here um, tonight as michelle has presented the sound mitigation we pulled that out we were actually going to be proposing at the end of the month early june all the amendments to the central business district but since this has become such a hot issue and it was pretty much done it was 85 percent done up until the end of last week or early, early today we just pulled it out so we anticipate having the the full amendments to the council in the next two meetings worst case three meetings to, to do exactly that and michael i know you know this but i just want to say it again right now it's one thing Summer is coming. Summer's gonna be if crazy. we don't get control of this now, by summer this is going to be the Wild West, and we just can't have it. And then down the road, <laughs> and I'm glad <laughs> it's Monday, and you're going to be talking to Tony Salerno before, well before the weekend. But if it continues, we're, we're, we're going to be asking for somebody to come make a report, like how many police officers working, how many summonses were given out, and how many arrests were made. Because I'm tired of like. Ah, uh, we let them go with a warning. You know, that's that's not cutting it, guys. Letting people go with a warning is not cutting it. So oh, I'll ask Salerno for the report now. It's okay. all computer generated. We can do it, and I'll get it from Salerno. Okay, thank you. That's all I had. Any other matters by council? Matters from the city manager. 
as the mayor mentioned, um, we are one of the few municipalities in the state that I've heard of that doesn't have a repeat offender burglar alarm ordinance. Um, so that will be for the next meeting. Um, the set aside ordinance in which the city is supposed to provide um, minority women, veterans businesses, um, preference in certain bidding aspects. We've talked about this a few months ago. This should be for discussion and introduction at the next meeting. And the property maintenance ordinance, which we discussed earlier in the year, has been given to the Quality of Life Committee. I asked for comments back from them early this week. And again, that ordinance will be recommended for an introduction at the next meeting on the 25th. That's all. Any matters from the city attorney? No matters at this time. Okay, and at this time, I'll open the meeting up to the public. As everybody knows, there's a three minute speaking limit. Um, please be courteous. When you come up to the mic, please say your name and address for the record. Hi, Mike Sedano, 1004th. Um, I know you just talked about it, but I would like to know what the plan and timetable are going to be, because all I've heard for weeks is about spend the money, spend the money, spend the money, and we still have no police walking the beats, walking the streets on Friday and Saturday night. And it's the Wild West. So it's not even summer. That's my question number one. What is the, what is the plan and the timetable? And how many people are going to be walking up and down the street? Because they have to walk up and down the street, not patrol in their cars. They have to be a presence there to stop people from loitering and defecating all over our property. Number two, you mentioned call the cops, call the cops, call the cops, call the cops when there's an incident. So we call the cops, the cops come, they look at the issue, but how does that help determine who is the cause of the, where, where the cause of the issues are when I've heard you talk about that you want to you're going to examine the liquor licenses when they come up for renewal. How does that help determine who, where these people are coming from after they destroy your property? How? I uh, thought it determined oh, patrol. Oh, sorry. Those are my questions. Well, I don't even know that I'm right, but I thought I thought police are partially allocated, and I could be absolutely incorrect on this based on number of police reports in an area. So I'm not necessarily saying it because they're gonna figure out what <coughs> bar the person who vomited on your property came from. I'm saying the, the increased number of reports increases the number of patrols in your area. One goes, right? So if there's no, if, if downtown never gets a call about any problems in the downtown, we don't need to allocate six officers downtown. If downtown, if there's 60 police reports from the downtown on a Saturday night, obviously we need to allocate officers downtown. That's my understanding of how it worked, but uh, certainly Michael or, or Salerno would know better than me. Okay, so it's really got nothing to do with the discussion of examining liquor licenses no, and- it, it ties in it and ties Fred, in. Fred can explain that. I mean, if we have so many premise reports, if you have, if John Moore owns Moore's Bar, and you have 50 calls there a year, then the city's gonna take action against me and, and the bar to like put on special regulations. And like, for example, Dino's, right? So I uh, obviously I know Dean, so Dean and I spoke a number of times today. He knows exactly where the kids who started the fight came from. They came from, you know, he, he, he told me the bar, I'm not gonna say the bar, he told me the exact bar that it came from. He, you know, it's my understanding he did a police report. He spoke to Salerno. He, about he advised bar. what bar that, that this is a continuous problem, and that's where it helps us when we're doing the liquor license. So there's two things. Okay, right? so it's two things. It's, right. Okay. One is the liquor license, so there's a two prong approach, right. and one is getting you the officers you need out there. Right. 
So we need police reports to get you the officers you need and an increased number. And then, and then as often as you can, if you could alert us to the particular establishment where yeah. you believe the, like you can't, right? Because right. you're closing at 11 and, and this is happening at two, but Dino's can, um, Mogo can, you know, they're, they're, they're open at those times. They can see them coming out from wherever, right. although I think we know two or three places. Um, where they're coming from and starting a fight. That, okay. that is certainly more helpful if you could name what establishment they are coming from. So our reports then help to justify the number additional of patrols. It, additional police officers. So right. when do we think that that's, those additional patrols are going to start We've coming on? We've been asking for patrols downtown for a week. It, it's been ongoing. And then this weekend there was a fight that started inside a bar. Um, someone didn't want to leave, started a fight with the bouncer, carried it outside, which was approximately 15 people, which five of our officers had to respond to. So obviously at that point in time, if five officers are responding to a brouhaha outside, that's going to shortchange elsewhere. So those, that's the ebb and flow of it. You know, we don't have unlimited resources to throw 40 officers at a time there. But when you have that sort of, we haven't had a fight like that in a, in a, a while, 15 people in a, in you know, a scuffle turns into we need to respond in kind, and there was five or six of our officers there at one incident. So that's where, you know, we can keep putting people there because we know that there's going to be issues, and then the documentation of it puts it on the liquor license. But the but the getting the patrols in the downtown, um, is, is that? They have been increasing. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, Pam Lamberton. Um, I want to speak tonight on behalf of Complete Streets, but real quick before I start, um, I've spoken in favor of the Dollar Tree store before, and I still support what they are trying to do, and if you can help them out, that would be great. Uh, number one, we have uh, warned before that uh, rejecting, flat out rejecting the Main Street Road Diet puts us on poor footing with the state of New Jersey. We have received word, and I'm asking the council to have Michael uh, Capobianco double check on this, but we have heard from the state that we will not be getting the LTA assistance grant. This is from De Debbie Kingsland, Kingsland, who is the acting manager <coughs> of commuter and uh, mobility strategics for the NJOT. OT. Um, uh, uh, Michael Capabianca is also still maintaining that Asbury Park is waiting for summer traffic reports. John Case, who is the Assistant Commissioner of Government and Community Relations for NJOT, says he is not aware of this and they are not preparing any numbers and not doing anything regarding that. Um, Mr. Capabianco has also said that the city has no input regarding uh, county projects in the city, such as um, the Sunset Avenue Bridge, but in fact part of the, the county plan says that uh, the county will share the cost of implementing complete streets policies uh, at a 50% level, so we do have as a city the ability to influence what they are going to do over there, and if they say they'll pay for 50% of it, then we would be uh, responsible for 50% of it. Um, we have uh, tried very hard to have conversations with Mr. Capobianco about uh, complete streets, but um, his response to us has been things like um, that our approach has been argumentative, and we just want to make sure that you all realize that our advocacy, uh, our tone is for advocacy and not to be argumentative. We have uh, said in the past that we are willing to sit down and talk about any of this with any of you. Um, Fire Chief Ketty uh, said he's interested in the road diet plan, but only if there are the preemptive lights on Main Street. Um, I don't know if you all are aware of that, but the state is willing to share the costs on that at a 75-25% share, so the city would only have to pay 25% of whatever that cost. And regarding the WRA, um, Mr. Capabianco has explained to us that 
uh, the opportunities that were lost down there to make complete streets were dictated by the WRA uh, that was approved in 2002. But he has explained that the city doesn't like what's going on down there and that I-STAR doesn't like what's going on down there. So if two parties in a, are in a contract together, both parties don't like what's going on down there, surely our redevelopment attorneys are in a position to stop what's going on down there and we can fix it. Thank you. Michael, you want to respond first? Sure. Uh, concerning the grant, <coughs> we received word today that we are still in the mix. Um, concerning the com assistant commissioner, I've been working with the project manager, um, Omar, who I'm still waiting to hear from for the traffic counts and other information, including the relining of the Main Street sewer. Sunset Avenue Bridge is a local road, not a county road. Uh, myself, the city engineer, Christine Ballard, and Robert Bianchini actually met with the county last week and the project manager and asked them to continue the project. The county actually didn't want to finish the project as is, which would have made it unsafe for pedestrians, but we told them to finish the project so that it was safe for people walking. Um, concerning preemption, I've been in discussions with the county over the last couple of weeks. Again, this goes back to working with Omar at DOT in regards to the design of the project. He hasn't gone back to me. And consider concerning the WRA, um, myself and Brian met last week um, after the quality of life meeting which you attended. And again, as I said at the meeting, neither one of us is opposed to doing anything um, concerning implementing aspects of complete streets. The city planner drafted regulations and these were given to ISTAR as part of the amendments to the plan. The plan needs to be agreed upon by both parties and there are much larger issues that are uh, in the plan amendments that we're looking at. Everything is important, but Brian has asked that we look at these things as one big plan amendment and not just go hodgepodge and pick and choose as we go along. But the city, as part of the amendments, Brian, as part of the amendments, have agreed to that there needs to be more improvements as part of pedestrians. Um, in regards to your statement that it's been argumentative, um, you yourself have written that we should not give building permits and hold back COs for I-STAR in which the response has been that's illegal. We won't do anything that's illegal. It's a negotiation and I-STAR is willing to talk, we're willing to talk. I-STAR's planner is reviewing the amendments we sent over to him. The city wants to have the best um, avenue for everyone to be here. We've, we're exploring it. It's a negotiation. and. Brian said he's more than willing to talk and, to, and agrees with everything in theory. But at the end of the day, we're now waiting on ISTAR to get to us their version of the amendments. And Brian last week said, let me get through the opening of the hotel. Let me get through the um, financial agreements for 1101, which puts us into around June. And then we'll sit down and discuss the amendments to the plan. Believe me, Pam, when I tell you, and I've told this to everyone who's listened, the city as a whole, myself, Michelle, have had numerous discussions about how to implement complete streets so everyone has an avenue here to walk, to bike, to run, to jog, to drive. It's a balancing act. And right now we're at the point where nothing can be implemented because there's nothing to implement. We've talked to DOT. We've asked for traffic counts. Omar said that they have them. Ray, who's the community advocate for DOT with us, said that they have them, we just haven't been provided them yet. And so <coughs> until we get the information, we can't act on anything. And just last week, I emailed Omar again saying, I need to talk to you. We need the traffic count information, and we need how to schedule the sewer upgrades that need to be done. Because the last thing we want to do on the sewer side is have DOT come in and pave the road, and then we need to upgrade the sewers and tear it up, which would be astronomically idiotic. We also don't have a set construction time frame because they've told us next spring, but when Mr. Keddy went to the utility clearance meeting, they told them construction should start in the fall. So no one has gotten anything to us that's actually concrete. And until we get something concrete, everything is, you just throw up your hands and say, DOT, give me the information as soon as possible. Not to mention, we don't have a copy of the road diet, right? So. I mean, part of what you all wanted me to, to do is vote yes on a road diet that was poorly presented.
represented riddles and errors that I've never even seen, and we can't get a copy from DOT. So, like, that is just irresponsible to me for me to vote to say I rescind my vote when I voted no on the road diet for something I, I don't have the... I, it could have Mickey Mouse lines on it the whole way down Main Street. I don't know. I've never seen it, and I can't get a copy from DOT. And, and so everyone here understands what we're talking about. My concern when the mayor and myself met with uh, Doug McQueen of Complete Streets was on Main Street at two lanes right now. We'll say, just using numbers, if 14 cars fit in a lane, that's 28 cars in between a block, in between traffic lights, the road diet would drop that to one lane and technically 28 cars. So if you're looking at 22 to 28 cars, how does that fit in a block? Are you going to have cars that are going to then go over into the box? Are we going to be having an issue with blocking the box? And what's the timing going to be where if you're going one way, what's the left going to be? Because now this left turn is going to be stuck, possibly, and blocking the other flow of direction. So we've asked from a public safety standpoint, how does this get fixed? What's the timing of the lights? What's the traffic counts? What's the queuing counts? And then on top of that, how do we get a, a, a fire truck or an ambulance across Main Street while that's happening and also the train arm is down? So those are two things back to back that we haven't had DOT addressed to us. And I expressed to Doug that the second that someone can remedy that, where we're not impacting public safety, I'll sit there and recommend to everyone it needs, we need to do it. But we haven't been able to justify yet that it's safe. The second we find out it's safe and the, the numbers match up, we don't have the numbers to actually do that analysis. And as the deputy mayor said, there was never anything given the last time. So that's what we've been asking for for DOT, is give us the traffic count so we can ensure the safety going both ways, coming back and forth. And I think the perfect example was a couple weeks ago, I was stopped right in front of the firehouse. There was a truck loading in the right-hand lane People were moving over to the left. Everyone was blocked. That's not safe. And how do we make that safe? How can we do that? What's your timing of the lights going to be? What's the volume of cars? Just give us the information so we can make a informed decision. All right. We have provided you with okay, Pam, Pam, Pam. mountains. Well, I'm sorry, but he just made another presentation. Well, okay, but your three minutes that is didn't, up. Didn't, your, your wasn't three, an answer to what I said. Your three minutes is up, Pam. You can get back up Wednesday and... I'm just going to answer a little bit. As much as Amy says, she didn't see the plan, but I believe it was August 2014 when we met in this room. And DOT and even Joe Grillo would say even, uh, I can't think of it. Tell me the name. Doug. Doug. Doug would say, they sent their third team. The DOT didn't have a clue what they were doing here. And that the plan was pathetic, pathetic at best. It was the worst plan I've ever seen in my life. They provided no loading zones for Main Street, no loading zones. They provided no bus stops for Main Street, which their partners, New Jersey Transit, runs buses up and down the street many times a day. This is truth. I mean, you can shake your head. This is the truth. I was at this one. They presented no tree planting pits. They said they would replace partial sidewalks and curbs. We said, no, we want the entire seven feet done. They said, no, we're just going to replace partial here or there. Filter skills. There was no current study on the amount of traffic per day. The last traffic report they had was off-season 2012. Off-season 2012 is a lot different than peak season 2015 or 16. They had no response of why and I asked the question, I said, look, you just guys paid part of uh, Route 71 in deal. Why didn't you put in bicycle lanes? Oh, we didn't think about it then. So, I mean, it was just like a terrible report. And there's no question about that. I appreciate Joe and Doug being honest saying it was a terrible report. They were not even aware that the Summerfield Avenue Railroad tracks had been closed down. So it was just like a terrible report. Now, on April 26, I went to Trenton. I attended a full day road diet session, not put on by the state of New Jersey, but put on by the federal government, a young lady from Nashville, Tennessee, and a gentleman from Baltimore, uh, Maryland, put on the presentation. 
I learned, I asked questions, and th there's different numbers for every state. Some states say over 15,000, if you stop it. Some say over 25, some say you say this, some say you say that. This Mr. John Case, the guy who clear cut the circle, Mr. John Case, the guy who clear cut the circle, who took his phone off the hook, was not available that day. But I did meet with Mr. Steven, and I'll give you his last name later. And I talked to him in depth during a break and said what we need is a count. Get us a recent count and we can move forward because our main thing is just what the city manager said, public safety. Convince us public safety will not be impacted and you can maybe switch our minds. And as far as you saying, take 25% of the preemption, that 25% could be over a million dollars. We don't know what it is. They won't give us a number. So there's too many variables on the state side. And again, it's people want to bust my back and I could care less, I got thick skin. I get up, I look at myself in the mirror, I go to bed, I sleep well at night sometimes. Uh, and you know, as far as like, yeah, it was my greatest victory because it was a terrible bullshit report by DOT just shamming something down with no background information whatsoever. And if we had accepted that report, people right now would be in here saying, you were stupid to accept that. Now, did we think they'd do a 180 and say, we throw in the towel and give up and now here we are? No, we're looking to negotiate. Again, this was a report that said, have left-hand turns on Deal Lake Drive going east, where you turn into the lake. So what kind of hell report was that? I mean, it made no sense whatsoever. And even coming west, there's two streets you would turn onto a left-hand turn lane. Deal Lake Drive, personally, I would rather see it be one lane, a bicycle lane, and maybe uh, diagonal parking on the lakeside to create more parking spots there, which we need for 510, 500 for uh, the Santander. And so we are open for negotiations, but so whoever John Case is, he can be like this Gary Carr nitwit from Trenton. <laughs> Come down, we'll talk to you, and give us the facts. But don't play like this cute little game. They tell you one thing, they tell us a different thing. And I believe maybe that's what's happening. And I don't know, but Pam, we are open for like discussion, negotiation. You guys have put on good presentation and everything, but when you put on the presentations, unfortunately, you just put out one side, and I don't blame them, but you don't put out the side where the plan they submitted to the city was the worst damn plan I've ever seen in my life. And you got a city manager, a planner, a fire chief, a police chief, a head of DPW. So seven salaries of over a million dollars. We should just like fire them all and say, no, DOT's right, our professionals are wrong. I'm sorry, but Chris is not fair. Okay, I'm but, not but to to yes, you are, three minutes on Wednesday. And you can write letters like you've been doing and everything. Yes, that's the way this government works. And I, I apologize if I ramble to on too much. And you, hey, I tell everybody, 732-988-7915, you all have my home phone number and I'll talk on talk to you for an hour on this issue. So you can all call my house. Thank you. Next. I'm Gail Helford from Fourth Avenue. Um, I'll preface this by saying that I'm 100% <coughs> supportive of all the construction, the building, and everything else that's going on in the city. It's very exciting to see the hotel and everything come up. But I did have a question. As I'm walking um, over the weekend and even today, I'm noticing that as you get closer to the, um, the Ocean Avenue and all, there are like to a, bl a block to a block and a half of uh, parking spaces that are being taken up by construction vehicles. And I would say there might be five or 10 construction vehicles taking up 30 to 40 spaces. They're not pulling into the spaces, they're blocking the spaces. And I was just curious when they got their permits and all, did they pay a parking fee for <coughs> taking those parking spaces or are they paying for those, those parking slots uh, during the day as they work? But it just seems to me that um, there's a lot of real estate being taken up by a very, very few number of uh, cars and they're just cross going perpendicular to parking spaces and not even going in. So that's my question. Okay, thank you. Michael? Uh, Barbara Van Wagner and I actually were talking about this late this afternoon because there, it is permitted to have temporary parking off street. Um, we're gonna have a further discussion next day or two with Michelle who's sitting there who didn't even know we had this discussion. It happened so late in the day that we do have to try to figure out a way that it's fair. Because if they're gonna sit there all day taking up two spaces, should they be feeding the meter for two spaces? Mm -hmm. Makes sense. 
but we do agree that something has to be done, whether it's in the redevelopment agreements or if it's just a general contractor. We have to figure out something to be done. Okay. Wh where are you saying that at? Um, I'll, I'll take a ride by. That's it's by like the Asbury? Yeah. 200 block of 4th okay. in yeah. that area. Thank, Thank you. you. Pat Fasano, 1001 Grand. A couple observations uh, you may or may not be aware of. I, I was out there Saturday morning with Tom, Malcolm, and, and Mike, and uh, a couple things that you may or may not be aware of. One, uh, I understand there's a, there was a food truck that's parked on the 700 block of Cookman Avenue that sells hot dogs, and that seems to be the scene of the crime where the two vomit spots were. Because, you know, it certainly wasn't pizza or meatballs. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> so I don't know if they have a permit for that food truck, if that's customary or, or not. Can you uh, get the name of that food truck? Because people send me pictures of that food truck. Can you, yeah. if you take a picture well, and text it to me? It's a hot dog truck, yeah. I but, know, but I can never, I, people I, but, but, tell us yeah. the food. They know exactly. I listen, the clock is ticking, people. I, my, I'm into okay. my two minutes here. All right, so that's one observation. The second observation, because you know I helped with the cleanup effort, a couple of the blue uh, drums that I've been admiring for the past 15 years were tipped over, and it's really a little irresponsible for a city to keep a uh, fifth, the, the round blue drums that say trash only, no recycling, because they tip over very easily. In a, in a Cookman Avenue setting where we've advanced to, we really should have concrete containers that you cannot tip over, and one should be, side should be recycling, and the other side should be trash. And then the, the third observation is, I 100% agree that uh, we should have foot patrols for, for 10 hours a week, and the 10 hours are basically from 10 o'clock till three in the morning on Friday and Saturday, because it's very difficult uh, for uh, restaurant and bar owners, I mean, you can control what's in front of your building, but once they leave your building, there's no way to control them. So that really has to go, if they're gonna go from one venue to another venue to another venue, which is called bar hopping, which is what's happening now, there's, you know, we can control people in front of our door, but once they move 100 feet to the right to buy a hot dog, there's, there's nothing, nothing you could really do, so the foot patrols would be helpful. So I know that Madison Marquette uh, provides uh, specials on, on the boardwalk if you're shorthanded, and maybe we can do some kind of a fund uh, for, you know, if you want to continue the, for venues that are open from 10 to 2, they kick in a few dollars each uh, to pay for the specials. I mean, just everybody should just get together and talk about it and come up with a solution. I think that's probably the best way to handle it. Thank you. Jim Henry, Sunset Avenue. Uh, just like to uh, comment on a few things. Uh, item C on the agenda tonight was the uh, presentation concerning the uh, change to the uh, uh, CBD uh, sound mitigation uh, regulations. I've been on the planning board for a number of years now, and every time we approve something in the CBD, there is a statement in the uh, resolution approving the plan, dealing with sound mitigation where it is appropriate. For instance, when there is a restaurant uh, opening up for or getting an approval from the planning board, there's a statement in there that says that they must comply with sound ordinances that the city has. And this is discussed at every uh, presentation to the planning board. And I think the problem is enforcement. Similarly, Michael made a comment concerning a, um, a, a loading truck on uh, Main Street. Enforcement is the problem. A voting truck? A loading, a loading. Oh. A truck that was I'm not loading dealing. or unloading. I'm not dealing well. Uh, <laughs> a truck that was unloading. Enforcement is the problem. They can't do that. They can't stop and double park on the street. but. Nobody seems to enforce that. Uh, also, I'd like to comment concerning the uh, waterfront redevelopment area uh, uh, plan amendments. If you'll recall, there was a committee put together that has not met in about five years. Uh, we spent, I don't know how many nights uh, going over 
the waterfront redevelopment plan and developing uh, modifications to that plan. Then the members uh, were no longer called to meetings. Uh, the, I guess the committee was uh, dissolved because it hasn't met in maybe four or five years. Uh, what happens to all these things? And we're talking now about uh, amending the plan and we're waiting for ISTAR. Um, you know, I hope we don't hold our breath till they get back to us. These things have to be brought to a head. And if you can't amend the entire plan, how about amending part of it to resolve some of the issues that need to be resolved? Thank you. I, just so you know, Jim, and I think Michelle would agree with me on this, you, you, the, the committee's report, it's a thick 80 or 90 page report that the volunteers did, is one of the foundations we used yeah. in the amendments. I mean, I, 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 my point to you is that your work was not, your work was very appreciated. It's one of the foundations we've used in the amendments. Just a comment on that, Amy. The fact that, that members of that committee never saw the final report, at least this member of that committee also, never received a copy yeah. of that report. And at the time, it was not completed. So I don't know what happened to it. Oh, there you go. Or Pam, if you shoot me an email, say, can you, can you attach the report? I'll attach it to you to give it to Jim. You just got to send me an email. I'm not going to remember. And concerning the planning board, there's the gap. The planning board application does require the sound mitigation. But if you're permitted by right, and you don't need to go before the board. By it's right? not as by right if you don't need to go before the board. Okay. It's not part of the checklist application because it's by right. So yes, the board has done their due diligence of anyone who's come before them has to do it, but it's the people that didn't have to go that were the enforcement issue and the knowing issue from our side of things. So it was the, the language of the, the plan was a little off because one side had to go, one side didn't have to go, and there was inconsistencies there. This is addresses it. But the planning board, as you said, 100% correct. Anyone before the planning board had to do it. Um, just a comment on that. There are ordinances on the book now that if the city wants to enforce, they can do that and they will solve that problem. The problem is that these ordinances are not being enforced. And if, even if uh, someone doesn't have to go before the planning board, the fact of the matter is that if that ordinance is violated and uh, the ordinance is enforced, then there's a penalty and the, uh, the, the guilty party can be made to remedy the situation. I, I'm not taking an issue with the, uh, with the fact that uh, a new ordinance is going to be uh, proposed. All I'm saying is that it, there, is ordinance, there are ordinances on the book and they are not being enforced and uh, the city is creating a lot of its own problems by not enforcing its own ordinances. Thank you, Jim. And I, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to take a shot at the uh, members of the, who work for the city or the city council or uh, the staff of the city. That's not my point. And I, I don't mean to throw anybody under the bus, but the fact of the matter is that we could do a better job and we have the tools to do it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Joe Grillo, uh, Cookman Avenue. Um, I wanted to uh, I wanted to, to speak real quick on the uh, the craziness that happens on downtown. So, this past weekend marks ten years that I've lived in Asbury Park, and in the that full decade, we've seen this argument happen over and over again, where new restaurants come in. Uh, maybe at first they feel that it's Asbury Park and they say that, oh, well, it's Asbury Park. You know, we're supposed to be wild. We're supposed to, you know, kind of uh, bend the rules a little bit in terms of what happens. And then they realize, no, this is a mixed use CBD and there are actual ordinances and, and rules in place. Uh, and over that time, we've, you know, we've become great neighbors, both the residents and the businesses. And it's great to see two awesome restaurateurs here that actually follow the rules. Jen, I know we can't say the, the we can't say the names of the bad people. Maybe they're too busy putting festoons up right now and the, can't uh, can't uh, control their customers. But Jen and Pat are great great people like that. My question is more about 
the ordinances that can be enforced when you have drunk people that are being loud, that are starting fights and everything on, uh, on Cookman Avenue, on Bangs Avenue. I had an incident just two weekends ago where somebody was, I caught this group of, of women defecating or attempting to defecate in the alleyway between my house and the business next to my house, and I yelled at them and shooed them off. <laughs> but I was wondering what, if there's a, um, if there's a nuisance ordinance or even a um, indecent, I guess you'd call it an indecent exposure ordinance <laughs> that can be that can and be enforced. Disorderly. I think disorderly co covers many of the things you're describing. We have a disorderly ordinance, right, in Asbury Park? There is. There's a chapter code where you can't get any sense of officer restraint. An officer can't allow you to use officer restraint. Yeah. And I do want to say that that the police the police department since since a lot of this started way back seven years ago, uh, where a lot of times you would have officers that would just come by and watch the drunken disorderliness happen and not let it, not do anything about it, the improvement in that has, has kind of evolved. Uh, I just think that this is something that everybody has to kind of be aware that it's going to be a continuous cycle uh, over time, but um, but if they can if they can enforce that drunken disorderly conduct and the nuisance uh, any nuisance ordinance that we may have, that's that would be great. So thanks. Thank you. Uh, Tracy Rogers, 900 Monroe. <coughs> I've been I, I've, I've been a consultant on many restaurants outside of Asbury, um, and I've been through a lot of liquor boards. There's some suggestions that you could probably use. <coughs> you can actually target those businesses with also putting cameras, the, nu the ones that have a nuisance, putting a camera also on their facility that the police have access to visualize. You can also do a blanket ordinance which puts it on everyone in a special entertainment district which allows them, the police, to review these situations so you can go back and say where these guys came from, or what they were doing. Um, you know, <laughs> one thing I don't want to talk about, but uh, some cities have made special entertainment districts which uh, call for a, a small rise in the taxes to pay for certain things where that can pay for the specials that are put on that uh, area to do it. But I think cooperatively, if you got everybody together, all the restaurants call them together. I mean, you can work out some deals that will benefit everybody. It's just a situ situation of communicating because you're never going to have, on a regular basis, anybody to catch everything that's going on and police to be out there at every single minute. So sometimes you got to reach outside the box to a damn different aspects of working together. Thank you. Thank you. Many years ago, uh, I'm going to be wrong on the year 2009, 2010, the city tried to get the CBD to start a SID, Special Improvement District, and everybody downtown said, no, go screw yourself. Let the city and the taxpayers pay for the, uh, all the costs. So that does not mean we cannot revisit it, and we will revisit it. You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. uh, I appreciate Pat volunteering to you know, bring that back up. When Pat was here when it was voted down, probably 99 to 1 by downtown said no. That the taxpayers pay for all the improvements downtown, and, and including the pavers, including the garbage cans, including everything. Okay, thank you. Rita? Hi. Uh, Rita Miranda, Wake Avenue. Uh, part of the problem is, I think, I think you have 44 liquor licenses, but you have, you have permitted people to drill holes in walls and pass them to another building, and now you have like 60 licenses. Even the ice cream place sells liquor on the same side as uh, the Seinbach's building. How does that happen? He sells shots in there with ice cream. I mean, like, you have so many liquor places now. Maybe you should look at your liquor licenses again and see that you are losing money by only having 44 licenses when you have 60 establishments selling liquor. That's one way to look at it. I mean, I wasn't going to talk about this tonight, but it's a big issue. I was going to talk about the pilot programs. 
I, that's my pet peeve besides uh, the mercantile licenses that don't get collected. In cop um, time, Rita, don't forget about cop time. <laughs> <laughs> the pilot pro, there was an article in the press. I don't know if anybody saw it. It was called Out of Balance. And it was all about the schools and how the pilot programs aren't paying school tax, which is a very big issue with me. I can't see why we're not collecting school tax. As you know, this past election, they passed, in Asbury Park, they passed to raise more money for the schools when they're already getting $80 million. Now we're gonna be taxed again for what? Another six million? These pilot programs, you know, if you read that article, I'm gonna try to get it for you. I have a copy home. But if you read that article, it's almost Asbury Park. We have the most pilot programs going. And in the end, they're really not, right now they're beneficial to you because you get 95% of the money, but they're not beneficial at all to the schools or any place else. And only urban cities do it. I wish we can get rid of that word urban because I don't think we are. I never did, I hated that word from the very beginning. I think Asbury is a resort area and that's it. But we're grouped in with Patterson, Newark, and all these other places when we're not that. So that would be a good thing if you could get rid of that word. I mean, words mean a lot today. There's a lot of words we can't say anymore because of what's going on, being politically correct. But uh, getting back to the liquor licenses, you have to do something about that. You can't have 44 liquor licenses in 60 places selling liquor. It's just you're losing a lot of money. And by the way, across the street, if the planning board is doing their job, I mean, just look at that place. It's right across the street from City Hall. They got most of the sidewalks with tables outside, which I know they only could get a certain part. They got, more, they got more tables than we have sidewalks to walk on there. So that's one place you can look at. So do I get an answer about the 44 liquor licenses? Yes, I'll give you an answer. Go ahead. According to the state of New Jersey, yeah. how, well, beverage control, everything's totally legal in Asbury Park. So if you have a problem, I guess you get in touch with either your senator or assembly people. We've met with both. We've met with representatives of the governor, and we've explained the problem, and they all say it's totally legal. That's it's totally legal. Yes. You don't have to have it. You're the ABC, the local one. Why do you have to have it? Because if we try to stop something that's legal, we're going to get sued, and you're going to pay like, you know, Part of the lawsuit. Well, that's the problem. I mean, maybe you ought to stand up to these lawsuits. You've got so many it, of them. It's not standing up to the lawsuits, Rita. I'm going to cut you off just as I did Pam. You had your three minutes. You asked a question. It's well, maybe you ought to follow Trump. It's been investigated by the state of New Jersey, and they say everything is totally <coughs> illegal. Well, you can talk to the governor. I know you... I know you... Know the governor, so you can call him up and talk to him. Thank you. Hi, Anita Wiener, <laughs> Madison Avenue. Um, this is, I live overlooking one of the probably nameless bars. And um, I'm j I was watching Saturday night. It was like 11.30 or 12, it wasn't even one or two in the morning because I tried to be asleep by then. There were two, uh, one policeman outside of that area, and there was uh, a yelling commotion, a young lady with a foul mouth and her boyfriend were just not getting along whatsoever, and they were running and chasing and yelling at each other, and there's a cop standing there. Eventually, a second policeman came by, and he sort of broke it up, okay, separated the two warring parties, and, um, one walked this way and one stayed this way. As soon as the one policeman left, she followed <laughs> the guy that she was admonishing very loudly. And the other policeman, there was no carry through. So my question is, how are these police officers being trained to deal with, or are they being trained to deal with drunk, disorderly, young adults, women who look fragile but aren't? So I don't think you can just put a cop there. If he doesn't know what he's doing, it could cause a bigger problem than it is now. Secondly, um, 
is it possible for some of the owners of these establishments to pay for their own security rather than uh, and get them physically out there and if somebody can knock over a bouncer, I don't know, maybe you need two or you gotta serve less potent drinks, something, so that they are monetarily responsible for keeping their area quiet and within the bounds of civility. Um, you know, when I moved in here, I know I was living in an urban area, but I didn't know I was living in, uh, you know, uh, the Bowery. So <laughs> I'm wondering if you could do anything about uh, those two issues. I'm finished. Many of the local, oh. Go ahead, no. no, I was just going to say many of the local establishments, and I'm, I, Jen Jennifer from the Bureau of Garden can probably talk about this better than I can, absolutely have their own security that they pay. Um, quite, quite a few of them, and one of the things we do when the liquor licenses come up to, to for, for your edification, Mike, is up the amount of security, um, up the amount of police officers, many of them employ Asbury Park police officers as their security, and those, that's how we make some of these recommendations. So, so many, many of the establishments have their own security and or Asbury Park police officers off-duty working their security in addition to Esbury Park police being down there? Well, I think my main issue is, are the police being trained to deal with these kinds of situations in an appropriate manner? Because if you have your own personal security and you have policemen there, there should not be the kinds of incidents happening. So, yeah, you know, I'm just hoping the police can, you know, get trained correctly. Thank you. Thank you, and just to reiterate, I mean, you, you heard the entire council tell the administration, we're not happy, fix it. We're listening to the public, you're not happy, fix it. So it's, it's a clear, fix it, please. <laughs> the city manager Michael. said he's gonna be talking to the police chief in the next 24 hours and probably making a presentation on Wednesday night. Okay, yep. uh, Jennifer Lampert, uh, Hack Street and the Beer Garden. Um, we went through a process where we had uh, off-duty police officers that we were required to have. Um, it was kind of a confusing process for us. So I met and worked with the chief of police for quite some time um, and put together an actual security plan for my restaurant. And it was a very, very frustrating process as a business owner, but in the end it was um, it was actually extremely rewarding and was great for my business. Outside of having to go through the process and come in with an attorney and go back and forth and talk about the situation, it didn't cost me a dime to sit down with my security team and my management team and say, okay, where are our weak spots? We're new to the community. What can we do um, to help and to work with the chief of police on that? And I know that any restaurant or bar that wanted to sit down and work with the, the city, the, the city would definitely do it. So. I'm saying to the council that maybe one of the things that could help with noise, it could help with security is, and it's really, if, if any bar owners get mad at me, I, I don't care. If the bar just has to submit a plan, it, it, they're not gonna be asset. They're gonna actually think about their business. You can even give them guidelines for what you want to see on their plan for noise, for security. And you know, in the end, my, my security go all the way from Moonstruck, which has nothing to do with me, but my patrons do disperse that way. That's as far as I felt was reasonable because they're not cops. Moonstruck, they patrol the Sackman lot. They come through my building. They go all the way around to where the distillery is going to be opening. And uh, even now, sometimes they go through the theater, like go over to House of Independence, check on them. And so they're basically walking the whole area to see what our patrons are doing. And it doesn't cost me anything extra. It cost me one security guy extra. The rest of it was making sure that my security team knows what our expectations as a business are. So that's something that starts a communication between the, the bars and the city and the police, and I think that would really help. And then additionally, some of our security, and I'd like to officially, one of these days when I can get it together, have a bar and restaurant association. So you know, Pat and I are friends, we communicate, other bar owners and I, we become friends and we communicate, but to make it official, okay, we're gonna get together once a quarter, twice a, every two months, whatever it is, and we're gonna look at what the issues that 
our impact as businesses on the city are having and what we can do to improve that. Already our security teams, if there's a problem at a bar and there's a fight with 15 people, it goes right through the city. The security guys are texting each other, watch out for this group. There was a motorcycle gang issue at one point, watch out for that group. So we're already trying to work together and I just wanted to say on behalf of myself and the other business owners, we're trying and um, I think if the city implements a mandatory submit your security plan, it's, it's, uh, it, would, it would help me. It helped me. So think about implementing that. Thank That's you. It. Thank you. Malcolm Navius, Cookman Avenue. I very seldom get up to speak, but I was just horrified by the, by the mess that was created by all this vomitorium that they had on Cookman Avenue. Now, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, we came to you with all these guys peeing in our lobbies, in our little uh, vestibules, making a mess, vomiting, and you said you, you uh, offered us the police department. You said that they were going to be extra policemen from 12 to 2 or to 4 o'clock, whatever it was, the time was, that there was going to be there. Well, I've got news for you. There was one policeman stand, sitting in a car on the corner of Cookman and Main. So the guys came around the corner and they were very quiet and they go up the street and they make a racket. And this guy didn't get out of his car once. Well, we're tired of it. We're tired of coming, you know, waking up in, on Saturday morning and Sunday morning and waiting to, 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 to see what's going to happen in front of our store whether they're going to turn over uh, 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 garbage cans or break pot plants outside. We can't leave anything outside. We can't leave a bench. We can't leave a, a, a pot plant with, uh, with, with, with plants to beautify our place. And, and nothing is being done about this. It's just, it's just horrifying. And thank you, Jennifer, for taking your part in, in, in doing that. But, you know, bar owners are interested and in your, in your block, and what happens in the other blocks? What happens when they get up to uh, Cookman Avenue, uh, the, the 600 block, or the 500 block, where there's no, where there's no restaurants around, aside from uh, the inevitable, uh, but there, there's no restaurant as, uh, on that side of the street, so there's no policeman there. There's nobody walking there, and it's just a disgrace. It's become, it's become impossible. Thank you. You know, I, I think this entire council agrees with you. I think that we tell Michael and Tony, and maybe now let's hope it's fixed because I'm not sure what more direction the council can give you to fix it, right? Because we do emails, we talk to you about it, we say money's not an issue, forget overtime, get the officers. Right? So, so, so th there's no miscommunication. And walking patrols. Listen, there is absolutely no miscommunication going to Michael or Tony. There is a disconnect clearly from Tony, Michael, out, right? Because there's no miscommunication from us to you about it. Motion to close. Second. Any other business? Motion to adjourn. Move.